Hello, my dear. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. Our topic today is very interesting about assisted reproductive technology, ART. So, what we want to discuss today, the definitions, the in vitro fertilization, IVF, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, XZ, gamete intrafallopian transfer, zygote intrafallopian transfer, the aim of ovarian stimulation, stimulation protocols used in IVF, and lastly, IVF protocol selection. Okay. Let us start our lecture. So, the first IVF, which was successful and resulted in a living baby, was in 1978. And since this date, more than 9 million children have been born through IVF or other assisted reproductive technology. So, what is the definition of ART? Assisted reproductive technology is a procedure, are procedures used to manage infertility or to assess any couple with infertility. And ART mainly belong to the field of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. So what are the examples of assisted reproductive technology? We have IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, and ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection and gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer okay so the most common nowadays is ICSI and IVF a while gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer is regressing too much okay okay so please look to this picture to understand the different assisted reproductive techniques in case of in vitro fertilization we do stimulation to the ovary ovarian hyperstimulation then when the follicle reach maturation we do ovarian retrieval at the same time, we take the sperm, doing washing for the sperm, and culturing, okay, in the culture media, and preparation of this sperm with oocyte retrieved, are collected inside the dish, then fertilization when happen with the development of embryo at day three or day five the embryo is transferred inside the uterine cavity this is called IVF okay but in case of ICSI the same procedure is done but we don't leave the sperm to fertilize the ova inside the dish like that but we inject one single sperm inside the oocyte okay so we can fertilize more than one oocyte but each one is fertilized by only one sperm injected inside the oocyte okay so this is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection while the others like gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer in case of gamete intrafallopian transfer sperm is taken washed and prepared then 
oocyte also retrieved from the ovary. Then both gametes, sperm and oocyte, are transferred to the outer third of the fallopian tube, guided by ultrasound transvaginally. Okay? Or via laparoscopy. So the gametes transferred inside the fallopian tube. So it's called gamete intrafallopian transfer. A while in zygote intrafallopian transfer, sperm is prepared, then follicle, the mature follicle, the oocyte is are retrieved from the ovary, then the dish containing both the sperms and oocyte is cured of then if fertilization happen and was diagnosed in the lab under the microscope the zygote is transferred vaginally to the uterine sorry sorry I'm sorry the zygote is transferred to the fallopian tube to the outer third also of the fallopian tube what is the difference than gamete and trafalubian transfer? We in gamete we transfer the gametes, the sperms and oocyte. So the fertilization will happen inside the tube. But in case of zygote and trafalubian transfer, fertilization occurs in vitro outside the gentle tract in the lab dish. Then observe it under the microscope, then the zygote is transferred to the outer third of the fallopian tube via laparoscopy. Okay? So, I have four important techniques in vitro fertilization, ICSI, intraceptive plasmic sperm injection, and gamete intrafallopian transfer and the zygote intrafallopian transfer. In case of IVF and the ICSI, the embryo is transferred inside the uterine cavity in the middle third of the uterine cavity by a caster, either in the ICSI or IVF, okay, a while in gamete intrafallopian transfer and zygote intrafallopian transfer, as I said before, the transfer occurred to the outer third of the fallopian tube. The only method in which fertilization occurs inside the tube is gamete intrafallopian transfer. And this suitable for some culture of people because they never accept fertilization outside the genital tract. So gamete intrafallopian transfer is a good choice for such people okay because other methods fertilization occurs in vitro okay so what is the definition of IVF it is a method of assisted reproduction in which men's sperm and the woman's oocyte are combined outside the body in a laboratory dish one or more fertilized embryo may be transferred into the woman uterus, where they may implant in the uterine lining and they develop. What about excess embryo? If I have other fertilized embryo, okay, it can be cryopreserved for future use. If this cycle didn't wasn't successful, I can repeat the trial in other cycle without stimulation because I already have embryos frozen in liquid nitrogen can be sold and transferred inside the trial cap.
So what is the indication of IVF? It is used to treat infertility due to either oligospermia, sperm antibodies, pubal dysfunction, tubal retinal factors, endometriosis, and unexplained infertility. So what about the procedure? The procedure start by controlled ovarian stimulation. What you are going to use for ovarian stimulation, I can use clomiphene citrate plus gonadotropines, or I can use gonadotropine alone. Sometimes I use gonadotropine releasing hormone agonist or antagonist to prevent premature ovulation. After sufficient follicular growth, human chorionic gonadotropine is given to trigger final follicular maturation and ovulation. Then, next step is oocyte retrieval. Okay, I wanna take the mature oocyte from the ovary. Okay, so when to take it and how? By using needle guided by transvaginal ultrasound after injection of HCG by 34 hours, oocytes are retrieved. Is there is alternative to the needle guided by transvaginal ultrasound? Yes, can be done by laparoscopy, but what is most common is the transvaginal ultrasound guidance. So, What about if I have a natural cycle? Natural cycle, I didn't do very stimulation. I can use a single oocyte retrieve. But the pregnancy rate in such technique is lower. Okay? But the complication of ovarian hyperstimulation and uh, multiple pregnancy is, of course, very lower than ovarian stimulation technique. Okay? Next step after I did ovarian stimulation, then oocyte retrieval, the fertilization. The oocyte are inseminated in vitro. Semen sample is already prepared washed several times with tissue culture medium and is concentrated for motile sperm. Then add it to the medium containing the oocyte. Okay? If just for IVF, this is quite enough. If I'm going to do XZ intraceptive plasmic sperm injection, I will choose single sperm to be injected inside the oocyte to do fertilization okay this is specially done in case of male factor when spermatogenesis is abnormal in male part okay next step is embryo culture after sperm are added the oocytes are cultured for about two to five days. So fertilization will happen in vitro, in the lab dish. Okay? Okay. Then examined under the microscope, if is it successful or not, and the vision happen or not. Next step is embryo transfer. Only one or a few of the resulting embryos are transferred to the uterine cavity. Why? I wanna to decrease the occurrence of multiple pregnancy because it carry complication. And this is considered the most important risk in IVF. 
So we are transferring one or two embryo, trying to avoid multi-fetal pregnancy. Okay, according to what the number of embryo, according to women age, with advanced age about 40, I may transfer, for example, three to four. If the patient below 35, I can transfer one or two, for example. Okay. In case of high risk for ovarian stimulation, I may stop and do freezing for the embryo to be used later on in next cycle. Okay? Okay. There is an increasing tendency to place only one embryo at each transfer and to freeze the remaining embryos for use in subsequent cycle if pregnancy do doesn't result. And in this picture, how to transfer embryo in the middle cell through the trunk cavity using caster guided by ultrasound as you see here and I have a previous lecture about uh, embryo transfer and the guidelines please go to it in my youtube channel okay about cryopreservation is it important is it carry advantage Yes, it makes the future ART cycle simpler and less expensive because I am not in need for ovarian stimulation again. I already have the embryo. Okay, less risky to the mother, of course, the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and so on. Less cost. Okay, so it is more easy more simple because I already have the embryo frozen just sewing the uh, freezed embryo and do transfer can be stored in liquid nitrogen up to 20 years or more and there is successful pregnancy or frozen stored embryo more than 20 years. Imagine okay what about success rate? In 2018 in the United States the cumulative chance of taking a home a live baby for each oocyte retrieval was 47.6% for women aged less than 35 years and 10.4% for women aged 41 to 42. You can see the difference in success rate according to the age. Let us explain the intracytoplasmic sperm injection as you see in this picture we inject single sperm inside the oocyte intracytoplasmic sperm injection is an in vitro fertilization procedure in which single sperm cell is injected directly into the cytoplasm of an oocyte this technique is suitable to who to patient with severe sperm disorder and also to couple when other techniques were unsuccessful or likely to be so. Oocyte are obtained as for IVF as I said before single sperm is injected into each oocyte to avoid fertilization by abnormal sperm so you are choosing the sperm to be injected. The embryo is then cultured and transferred as for IVF. 
okay as mentioned before when it was first applied the spur the intracellular plasmic sperm injection in 1988 it was first used in cases of fertilization failure after standard IVF or when few sperm cells were available. And the first pregnancies were reported in Belgium in 1992. In the setting of male factor infertility, this technique has consistently demonstrated higher fertilization rate than prior micromanipulation technique. So, it is a, is a method of a choice in case of male factor infertility. The capacity of eggs to permit almost any type of spermatozoa to fertilize or site has made it the most successful treatment for male factor infertility. In 2014, over two thirds of all ART cycle in the United States involved intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Okay, so the majority nowadays is by intracytoplasmic sperm injection. But you should know that there is no benefit to using intracytoplasmic sperm injection in couple with low oocyte yield or advanced maternity. So it is not of a choice in such case. Is there a risk of birth defect in ICSI? Yes, some studies suggest that there is increased risk because of the following. The procedure itself can damage the sperm, egg or embryo, sperm from men who have mutation of the Y chromosome may be used And you should know that most reported birth defects involve the male reproductive tract. What about the other method for ART, which is the gamete intrafalubian transfer? It is similar to IVF, but gametes like oocyte and sperm are transferred, as I said before in the first picture, to woman fallopian tube rather than her uterus. Where is the fertilization? Fertilization now will happen inside the tube. So, this woman should have a healthy tube. Okay? Because fertilization will happen inside the fallopian tube. And you will transfer the gamete, the oocyte, and the sperm to the outer third of the fallopian tube, where fertilization happen, and then the fertilized ova will go through the tube to the uterine cap by itself. Okay. Multiple oocyte and the sperm are obtained as for IVF, but are transferred transvaginally, guided by ultrasound or via laparoscopy to the distal fallopian tube where fertilization occurs, as in this picture, we inserted the sperm and oocyte here in the fallopian tube, where fertilization will happen in this part of the tube. Okay, I said to use gamete intrafluvian transfer, women should have a normal fallopian tube. Is it considered as a gamete intrafilament transfer as a common method of ART? No. It constitutes less than 1% of ART procedures performed in the United States. What about leave birth rate per cycle? It is about 25%. Let us go to the fourth method of ART, which is zygote intrafalubian transfer. 
This technique differs from gamete intrafluorescent transfer in that fertilization takes place in the lab rather than the fluvian tube. But it is similar in that the fertilized ova is transferred to the tube rather than the uterus. Zygote are transferred to the fallopian tube via laparoscopic procedure. Okay? Okay. Today, zygote intrafallopian transfer compresses less than 1% as in case of gamete transfer of ART procedure performed in the United States. So, both of them regressing too much. Okay, so let us explain the aim of ovarian stimulation in ART. The aim of ovarian stimulation for ART is through administration of exogenous gonadotropines is to raise the circulating serum FSH level above the threshold to induce the growth of 10 to 15 follicle rather than a single dominant follicle as in nature cycle. So I need many follicles, 10 to 15 follicle, so I need to give exogenous gonadotropines. Success in ART depends on adequate follicle recruitment, I mean number of oocytes, and the development, I mean the quality of oocytes. So two important factors for successful ART, number of oocytes and the quality of oocytes. Okay, what are the factors affecting the success? The age of the woman, the younger the woman, of course, the more successful in RT. The weight, ovarian reserve, endocrine conditions that in affect the follicular recruitment during ovarian stimulation. And you should know that the chances of live births are lower if fewer than four oocyte or three. If you did, if you did were in hyperstimulation and you found less than four mature oocyte, this is means that the successful occurrence of live births would be lower than if you got more oocyte. I said before, number and the quality of oocyte. Okay, so what about simulation protocol used in IVF? It will be explained in details in the next slides, but please concentrate with this one because I summarized it here. Okay, I have the agonist protocol, antagonist protocol, and the minimal stimulation protocol. Okay. What about agonist protocol? In agonist protocol, I stra I'll start from day 21 in the previous cycle by giving the patient tryptorelin GNR. GNRH agonist, 0 0.1 milligram from day 21 going on till day 14 or occurrence of more than 2 follicle 18 millimeter in diameter, reaching maturity, I mean, the OSI, okay? But I'm going also to add gonadotropin from day 2 up to day 14 or reaching more than 2 follicle, each one 18 millimeter 
in diameter or more. Okay, so from day 21 in the previous cycle, I'm going to start the GNRH agonist 0.1 milligram every day. Then going on, then the next cycle till day 14 or reaching maturity of the follicle of more than two follicle more than 18 millimeter in diameter. And I'm going to add gonadotropin from day two in a dose of 150 up to 225 every day from day two till day 14 or reaching more than two follicle with diameter 18 millimeter or more. Okay. So the gonadotropin will be ranging between 150 up to 225 international units. Okay. After that, when I reach this number of follicle and uh, it is mature, I'll give HCG 5,000 international unit from 5,000 to 10,000 HCG. Then oocyte retrieval will start after 36 hours. Okay. This protocol is called long agonist protocol. The next protocol is antagonist protocol. In the antagonist protocol, I'll start to add the trope in a dose of 150 up to 225 international units. Daily from day two, okay, up to day 14 or reaching the follicle, the mature follicle, 18 millimeter in diameter or more, and the number of follicle more than two. And I will add on day six. GNRH antagonist, for example, Cetro Relax, 0 0.25 milligram every day till day 14 or reaching more than two follicle with diameter more than 18 millimeter or equal to. Okay. Then I'll give HCG. As I mentioned before, 5,000 up to 10,000 international unit intramuscular. Then oocyte retrieval after HCG injection by 36 hours. This protocol is called antagonist protocol. GNRH antagonist protocol. So now we finished the, the GNRH long agonist protocol and antagonist protocol and lastly i'm going to discuss the minimal stimulation protocol the minimal stimulation protocol i'm going to give hmg roman rosal gonadotropin starting from day two okay and i'm going up to day 14 also And I'm going, as before, and I'm going to add clomiphene citrate on day six, or earlier than that, according to the level of LH and the estrogen level, up to the day 14, reaching more than two mature follicle 18 millimeter in diameter. Clomiphene citrate given in two doses, 50 milligram twice daily, 
So the gooseberry day is 100 milligram. Okay. And I can use, in spite of clomiphene citrate, litrozole, 2.5 milligram, start day two for five days, 2.5 milligram twice daily from day two for five days in spite of clomiphene citrate in, in certain cases. Okay. together with HMG. Then, but letrozole will be given only to five days starting from day two. Okay? But in case of colomphan citrate, I can start at day six or before, according to LH level and the estradiol level, and to continue till day 14 or reaching the mature follicle more than two. Then I'm going to give HCG injection, 5,000 to 10,000 intramuscular. Then after 36 hours, oocyte retrieval will occur. Okay? This protocol is called minimal stimulation protocol. So I explained now three protocols long agonist protocol, antagonist protocol, and minimal stimulation protocol. This is what I explained in the picture, in details. And all this explained in the picture, but I wanna to explain some related to the the minimal stimulation protocol. I wanna to comment on this protocol that this is an attractive option. Why? It has a lower cost and the lower use of gonadotropin and pool. and also has a similar pregnancy and transplantation rate to GNRH agonist protocol. So it's very interesting and attractive one. Also, one of the advantage that it limits the daily monitoring visits and the ultrasonography compared to the standard protocol. Hence, this protocol can be considered a better option in patients with poor ovarian reserve and the poor responders. Nevertheless, this protocol has a major disadvantage of decreasing follicular development for patients with normal ovarian function. Okay. So let us go to the important item, which is IVF protocol selection. The use of long agonist protocol, antagonist protocol, or minimal stimulation protocol in each patient is usually based on physician decision. But the decision is based on the benefits and the shortcomings of each treatment option, and the most importantly, on the patient response, of course. Okay, so you should classify your patient. Grand turbine stimulation patients fall under three categories based on their response. Either high responder, intermediate responders, and the poor responders. Okay, so what are the criteria used for defining poor ovarian response? The FSH level, the oocyte number, the cycle cancellation rate, the gonadotropin dose, and the estradiol levels. 
and the many screening tests such as ovarian reserve, glomerulonephritis citrate challenge test, measurement of anti-mullerian hormone and antral follicular count have been introduced over time. Poor ovarian response occurred in how many patients? In 9 to 24 percent of all IVF cycles and is defined as decreased ovarian response with sufficient stimulation. Although you give the patient sufficient ovarian stimulation, you have a poor ovarian response. Poor response has been shown to be associated with advanced maternal age, which is a very important factor that affect oocyte quality and the follicle number. This has also been observed in some young patients, but the cause is unclear. Why it happened in young patients is not clear till now. And in 2011, the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology defined poor ovary response, P-O-R, poor ovary response. If the woman have two of three features. So if there is two of three features, we consider poor ovary response. The first advanced maternal age equal to or over than 40 years or any other risk factor for poor ovary response. The second a previous poor ovary response, I mean less than 3 oocyte with conventional stimulation protocol. Equal to or less than 3 oocyte with conventional stimulation protocol. The third category, an abnormal ovarian reserve test. Like what? Like if antrofollicular count from five to seven follicles. Like serum anti hormone ranging in between 0 0.5 up to 1.1 nanogram per milli. So, I'll say, according to ISHRI, the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, in 2011, they said, if two features of this three available, so this is poor ovary response. Advanced maternal age equal to more than 40 years or other risk factors. Second, less than or equal to three oocyte with conventional stimulation protocol. If you give the conventional stimulation protocol and you got only mature follicle three or less. And the third one, if the patient has poor or abnormal ovarian reserve test. And the, the most important two in uh, ovarian reserve test is the antrofollicular count done by ultrasound. When we do some of the antrofollicular count in the irrefollicular phase, in the, the sum in both ovaries, and we found this number of follicle five to seven, this is abnormal ovarian reserve test. Also, if we did serum antimalarial hormone and we found that at any time of the cycle, and we found that 0 0.5 up to 1.1 nanogram per milli. So any two of, or, uh, of these three major features is considered poor ovary response according to the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology. This is the last slide. Please see these links. This is my link on Amazon as an author for this Four books, textbook of obstetric, textbook gynecology, contraception handbook, and the multiple choice question book. Also, this is my link on YouTube in which this lecture is present and the other lecture of OB Guide. More than 90% uh, of lectures of obstetric and gynecology available right now. And the other link is my blogspot where there is some 
some articles and some picture of my operations you can see them please visit my site please go to amazon to see sample of my books and you can get it through amazon thank you